Hey everybody, it's Jason Blaha here, and it's time for part two of the Q&A, so let's go ahead and knock this out. All right, first question. You said people only need to walk for cardio to be healthy. I do and walk fast, but when I run or jog just for a few minutes, I'm already winded, probably because I'm not used to it, but it makes me feel as if I'm out of shape. Yeah, as far as just basic health goes, uh, brisk walking for 30 minutes a few times a week will give you most, if not all, the health benefits that you really want to get out of, of cardio, meaning uh, getting up, getting your blood circulating, uh, working on your overall endurance. I mean, you could walk further than that as well, and it would improve overall endurance. I think the difference we're talking about here, though, is basic health versus actual athleticism. And in the case of athleticism, you really need to... Uh, factor in either conditioning or endurance there and yeah your conditioning sucks if you struggle jogging but you know what if you've been walking briskly for a while you already have a base endurance you already have a base cardiovascular capacity so if you started jogging three times a week uh, within a couple of weeks you would find it to be really really easy it's the issue of just adapting to it it would be the same thing if you started jogging a little bit and then you find you don't have any true athletic level of endurance and you can't run a marathon, you know? It's it's just understanding that there are different degrees of athleticism, conditioning, endurance. And some things you're just trying to get baseline health benefits, get most of the health benefits, uh, you're gonna get it from just brisk walking. So that's what people need to remember. There's a difference between athleticism and basic health. And a lot of times these minor things that can give you the basic health, like again, you can get 80% of the health benefits of any degree of cardiovascular conditioning with just brisk walking. So you don't have to do anything extreme, maybe even 90% of the health benefits. Same thing with weightlifting. You can gain 90 plus percent of the health benefits just lifting moderate, uh, twice a week. You don't even have to really go that heavy. You don't have to get to where you even squat three or 400 pounds or deadlift 400. Those are athletic goals, not uh, just health and fitness goals. So you need to understand the difference between the two and that uh, just reaching peak health doesn't require anywhere as this extreme of training as uh, obtaining a really solid level of athleticism. So uh, just think about it from that perspective. And you know what? The thing is, at the end of the day, humans gain endurance easier than any other performance element. So now that you've got a baseline endurance, I think you'd find that if you branch over into other types of specific endurance training, whether it's jogging, running, uh, even doing marathons, things like that, you'd find it wouldn't be that hard for you to get yourself to that level of conditioning if you're already basically in shape. All right, next question. Hey Jason, I'm losing a lot of strength on my cut even though I'm keeping my current protein intake at 220 grams a day while currently weighing 220 pounds. Staying around the 6 to 8 rep range on most of my compound lifts, 8 to 12 on isolation, push pull 4 times a week. Should I be decreasing my reps and increasing my protein even more? I really want to lose fat but I also want to keep my strength as much as possible. Would a refeed day help me? Please help. Thanks. All right, brother, it sounds like you're cutting too quickly without refeeds. Honestly, 220 grams of protein, you're not, if you're still losing strength while taking in that much protein while cutting, you're trying to cut too fast or you're trying to train with too much volume with high intensity. The thing you need to realize is that, yeah, you can train heavy, you could train with high volume, you could do whichever you want to do while you're cutting. But the thing is, you can't be running sets to failure. You can't be trying to push yourself to the limits to where you're trying to gain strength. You're trying to gain muscle because when you do that and you're cutting, unless you're cutting absurdly slow, like I'm talking losing a pound a month, not two, three pounds a month, not a pound every week, none of that stuff if you're trying to actually gain strength and muscle. It's not going to work for you at all. And it sounds like you're a pretty big guy already. So you should realize that by now. Know your body well enough to know that any sort of fast cutting, uh, you're going to regress. And if you're trying to actually make gains instead of just going in and saying, what's what do I need to do to burn calories and what do I need to do to maintain my strength and muscle in the gym? And sometimes that means if you've been able to deadlift uh, 500 pounds for sets of five, you might need to cut down to 480 for sets of five while you're cutting because you know what? That will maintain your strength levels. That will maintain your strength. That will maintain your muscle mass, but it won't be pushing your recovery beyond the ability to recover. So if you're coming in and you're doing really difficult sets and you're hitting, doing max effort work or training to failure and stuff, and you're losing weight while cutting, of course your strength is going to regress because you're impeding your recovery ability instead of saying, What's, what do I need to do to maintain it? 
Now, that being said, can you use weight training to help burn extra calories? Yeah, you can do weight training or cardio for that. Either one works. I would tell most guys focus on maintaining your strength and then do extra cardio to burn calories, but there are people who successfully do the other approach as well and just do tons of volume. And you know what? There are plenty of people who do that successfully. I just think it's difficult to recover from. Hence the reason I try to push cardio more for the actual calorie burn. So that being said, what you're probably doing, you're either pushing yourself too hard in the gym while trying to lose weight or you're trying to lose weight and body fat too quickly and you need to scale it back a little bit. And I think if you scale back the weight loss just slightly and back the intensity down just one notch or half a notch in the gym, I think you're fine that your strength is going to maintain a lot better. You'll be able to keep what you have and continue to lose body fat. All right, next question. Hey Jason, can your new one to three set intermediate program be used effectively by a late novice who doesn't want to spend hours trying to claim 10 to 20% more strength and size gains? Of course, he, she should make sure to progress faster. Let me know your thoughts and keep up the good work. You know what, I think that's perfectly acceptable, particularly considering you're saying you don't wanna spend huge amounts of time in the gym and that program is flexible and allows you to pick how much time you wanna spend in the gym based on your needs. You know, you're gonna be in there lifting anywhere between 30 minutes and an hour, but it's based upon which variation and uh, model of the program you run. And that's why I left it really flexible for that purpose so that you can decide what meets your lifestyle. And if you wanna run it and get in and out of the gym three times a week uh, at 30 minutes each, yeah, you can run that variation of it and you'll make gains just fine. And because you're still in the late novice phase and not a true intermediate, you're simply gonna find that you're gonna progress faster and easier. And ultimately what that means is you will probably, on all of those exercises that you're doing, you'll probably be able to add a rep every single session. So if you're just doing what you're able to do and you run the program the way I kind of broke it down as far as making the progress and the progression rate based upon uh, are you hitting grinders or not? And if not, you know, continue to increase reps. And once you reach that eight rep threshold, you uh, increase the weight. What you're gonna find is that if you're able to progress faster, you're automatically gonna progress faster if you're following my instructions there. So there's no extra need to really pay attention to it between a late novice and an intermediate you're simply just going to add reps more quickly and uh, you know in which case sometimes you might gain two reps in a session so again it's going to be fine and I think it's totally acceptable and it will help you finish out your new gains and even if you're you know say nine months into one of my novice oriented programs and still have three months left in it and you choose to switch over to that intermediate program you're still going to reach the novice strength standards doing it will it take you a couple weeks longer maybe it might take you two weeks longer it, so or four weeks longer so it might take you four months instead of the three months to do it but you know what you'll still get there because you're still using progressive overload still using high frequency you're still using acceptable training volume that's the secret that's the key to gaining strength and size so if you run it that way it, it, before you reach the intermediate you've already built your base as a novice then yeah i think it'll be perfectly acceptable i think it'll be fine all right next question Hey Jason, since progressive overload is the main factor in muscle growth, doesn't any kind of progression give basically the same amount of muscle growth depending on how advanced the person is or if they are eating, sleeping enough, for example, improving on a 5x5, 3x3, or 5x3, or even improving on one given work set? Yeah, there's some truth to that. And at the end of the day, as long as you're getting stronger on at least one set of one of your basic lifts, or particularly one of your basic lifts that hit each basic muscle group, you're probably gaining muscle about as quickly as you're gonna gain it. Now, could there be variations in that? Meaning could, if you used a different method, could you be gaining maybe 10% more muscle per month? Yeah, probably. But you know what? Are you going to notice 10% more muscle per month? Probably not, because if you're not really a novice anymore, and you've been in the gym training hard for over a year, you're not gonna be gaining more than about a half a pound of muscle per month anyways. are you really going to notice a difference between a quarter of an ounce extra muscle gain per month? Probably not. So at the end of the day, as long as you're progressing on your major exercises, at least most of them, uh, regularly, at least once a week, you're seeing at least one of your major exercises increase on at least one set. You're probably, unless again, you're a ranked novice, in which case you should be seeing an improvement almost every workout on something, if not everything. But if you're out of the novice phase and you're seeing any progress on the, the big lifts regularly, yeah, you're probably gaining muscle at somewhere between 80 to 100% of what you could possibly be gaining. And uh, everything else is just academic at that point. It's just extraneous. Uh, because at the end of the day, as long as you're getting 
progressive overload on something, even if you're just doing one set of three reps, which I would not recommend, by the way, for muscle growth. I don't want people to think I'm recommending that. But even if you're getting stronger on that, and that's all you do, even while it's not ideal uh, for gaining size, you're still probably going to be growing decently off of it because you're actually progressing and the progressive overload is going up on big lifts. And that's what will put the most size on you. It might not be 100% of the size gains, but it's going to be the vast majority of it no matter what. So really at the end of the day, you're right. As long as the progressive overload is there, you're probably going to grow at a decent rate no matter what you're doing. Again, but the trick is, is the progressive overload there? And sometimes that's where the fine tuning comes in to where you actually do have to pay attention to your programming because sometimes the progressive overload stops even though you think you're doing everything right. And that's because you're possibly not growing, not adapting, not getting sufficient stimulation. So there's something else going on there at that point. All right, uh, next question. Hey Jason, what are your thoughts on reality TV shows like The Biggest Loser and Extreme Weight Loss? Most of the time the women are over 250 pounds and their trainer always recommends she eats 1500 calories a day. Would this type of dieting hurt a woman's metabolism? Uh, good question. You know, the thing is, I don't believe in this metabolic damage nonsense. I honestly think it is nonsense, and I think there's just a few people out there trying to promote it because they base part of their careers on it, and it's a big marketing niche for them. There's people who are selling metabolic repair services for hundreds of dollars to, you know, dozens if not hundreds of people. So you need to keep that in mind with that. Uh, as far as it damaging metabolism, no. Yes, these women are 250 pounds. But, you know, if a woman was 130 pounds, you might put her on a 1500 calorie a day diet also if she wanted to lose a little body fat. What you need to realize is that these women have massive energy reserves. A 250 pound woman can easily easily lose five times as much body fat, if not more every week as a 130 pound woman without losing any muscle mass. So keep that in mind. In fact, if you start having them resistance train uh, with any degree of intensity, some of these 250 pound women could be losing three or four pounds of body fat every single week while actually gaining a little bit of muscle mass. So if they're able to lose body fat at a massive rate while gaining a little bit of muscle, their metabolism is only going to go down in the sense of if you shed 100 pounds of lard off of your body, you're going to burn less calories. Carrying around 100 pounds of lard is going to make you burn through calories. If you don't believe me, um, go put 100 pounds in a rucksack or even a evenly disperse one with the front and back and go walk around with it and try to do day-to-day -day activities and tell me you don't burn an enormous amount of extra energy from that extra 100 pounds. Uh, so their metabolism loss is going to come from the fact that they've shed 100 pounds of lard off of their fat asses. So when you look at it from that perspective, sure, their metabolism is going to go down quite a bit. But is it due to hormonal shifts? No, not really. And there's no reason, as long as they're under the care of a medical doctor, that these women can't be uh, on a 1,500 calorie a day diet and be losing three or four pounds of body fat every single week. Now, the problem is that ultimately the biggest loser stuff is that it seems like a lot of it's crash dieting and doing a lot of really stupid stuff instead of a really consistent, solid program uh, that someone could do for life. Like any sort of boot camp type thing is really a bad idea. Uh, because it's it's trying to get you to kickstart something, which is stupid. Kickstarting something never works in the human body. In fact, it gives short-term results, and then there's oftentimes blowback. But could these women go on balanced, healthy 1,500-calorie diets and do resistance training and cardio every day and uh, safely lose weight? Yeah, they just might do it slower than what they have them do on these biggest losers. And that's the problem is that ultimately they have them do crash course type thing that there's no way they could maintain as a lifetime endeavor and so they get used to doing it that way and then when they could no longer live that lifestyle once they've lost a lot of the weight they tend to rebound because they've been taught crash course methods to lose body fat uh, through trying to shock their body and doing extreme things rather than just a change in lifestyle that makes it nice and gradual and smooth and something that they could maintain for many years on end and that's why they regain the weight it's because they haven't been taught the proper tools and methods to keep the body fat off by changing their lifestyle instead they've had a bunch of crazy boot camp type nonsense thrown at them and sometimes diets that are difficult to follow but it's not the caloric intake that's the problem there uh, that caloric intake is fine because they're going to lose fat pretty rapidly on it um, and you have to remember that someone who is very grossly morbidly obese with 50 or 100 pounds of extra body fat they need to lose, they can lose body fat at an absolutely enormous 
rate per week compared to other people without it really becoming an issue as far as slowing down thyroid function or losing muscle mass or things like that. Um, they have a massive reserve to draw from that the body will very easily and readily tap into without any problems. And that's the difference that you need to remember is that the leaner you get, the harder it is to lose body fat without losing muscle mass and without having uh, energy problems and everything else. But someone who's that obese, totally different animal. They have basically an enormous fuel tank that their body can easily tap from without having any uh, other issues associated with it. All right, guys, but that's really all I have to say on that today. I hope it's been informative and I will talk to you guys next time.